Brothers and sisters, good morning. It's a, that was a beautiful Lord's Day. Every day is a Lord's Day to us Christians, but the first day of the week is a very special day because that is the day that our Lord salvation was given to his creatures. And we are blessed to be his, his he built us and made us. I'm going to be reading Luke 16, 19 through 31. 19 through 31, Luke 16. <clears throat> okay. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in hell. Where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham or far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony and a fire. But Abraham replied, son, remember, that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers, let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone comes from the dead to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rise from the dead. That is scripture. Amen. Amen. Thank you, James. James and his wife, Jeannie, are from Yakaipa, and they've been here for about a month, and then they're... they're about ready to go back home, and James has offered to assist in any way, and we've invited him to participate several times, and we will miss you and look forward to you coming back in about a year, and uh, I think you said you might even stay longer, so we're looking forward to that. And um, <clears throat> we're always happy to have Barbara with us. She's been attending a uh, she was uh, invited by Amy, and we've grown very close to you, Barbara, and we're very happy that you're coming here. <clears throat> and Ruth Varley, we're so happy that you've been able to be here. Where are you? And uh, she's going back home. She's a good friend of the Madrigals, and uh, she lives in Washington, and uh, we're so happy that you've been able to be with us as well. <clears throat> Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Before I do that, let me just mention that Bobby has had an MRI and her back is in horrible condition as a result of her cancer and she's not expected to live. Bow with me. Father in heaven, our prayers go out to Bobby on her behalf. And we pray, dear Lord, that you will care for her and comfort her and relieve her pain. Father, she was a member here for many, many years, dear friend of us all. And we pray, dear Lord, that you would 
bless Sharon as she cares for her mom. And Father, we pray that you would do everything that you can do for her at this time. Father in heaven, we know that sooner or later we must cross that so-called river of Jordan and leave this world behind. And we do not know the time of our departure. But we do know that it is appointed for us to die if the Lord does not come back before that. And we pray, dear Lord, that we'll always be ready and vigilant and prepared. And Father, we pray that we will also warn others of the dangers of not being prepared to meet you in judgment for their lives. Help us, dear God, to take eternity seriously. That there are two destinies, one for the righteous and one for the lost. And we pray that the fear of anyone being lost will motivate us to share the gospel with them, the way of salvation through Christ our Lord, through whom we pray. Amen. A number of weeks ago, my neighbor asked me to, to study with me on the subject of hell. And um, we were trying to arrange something, and so I decided to tell her that, you know, I'm sure your questions are very similar to the questions that many people have, and I'll speak on this subject, and hopefully you and your mom and father and your husband can be there. And they're living together just right across our driveway. And uh, they all said they'd be here, and then the twins, they're about two years old, one of them was in the ER yesterday, and so I got a text last night saying that they can't be here, but will it be recorded? And so I told her that we're going to put it on our web page so that they'll be able to see it. I'm disappointed that they can't be here. We will probably have a class one-on-one -on -one with them, uh, but, but I find it very encouraging that they would hope that we would post it somewhere where they could listen to it. So um, it's quite a challenging subject. It's one that I wish didn't exist. Of all the subjects that I'm uncomfortable with, it's talking about hell. Um, it's something that some criticize Jesus for even believing in hell. Bertrand Russell, the great renowned philosopher and atheist of the 20th century, said one of the flaws in Jesus' character is his teaching about hell. And um, uh, obviously, um, his flaw in his character is that he minimizes the seriousness of sin. And uh, if we got God's point of view of the seriousness of sin, maybe we would understand the necessity for hell. But we'll talk about that a little more. Um, and it's true. I will admit it that no one talks about hell more than Jesus in the New Testament. Just for example, he says here in Matthew 13... The Son of Man, verse 41, will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then you turn over to Matthew 25 and we have the judgment scene. And here we find, in verse 41, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And then in verse 41, These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And you know, that's just a few of the many, many passages that relate to the subject of hell, coming from the lips of Jesus. 
Now, one of the most powerful statements made by the Apostle Paul that will sort of be the basis by which we pursue this study is 2 Thessalonians 1, if you want to turn over there, in 8 and 9. <clears throat> Actually, let's go back to verse 7. And the Lord will grant you relief who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his might. When he comes on the day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. Now, this lesson presupposes that hell is real. I take seriously the teachings of scripture. I believe that they are fully inspired delivered by the Lord himself uh, through his prophets and through his apostles. And the teachings with regard to heaven are real, and the teachings with regard to hell are real as well. Now, if we were a bunch of unbelievers, my approach uh, to support the idea of hell would probably be that of C.S. Lewis in his defense of hell in his book, The Problem of Pain. But I'm assuming that we all believe the word of God and that uh, I don't need to do that. And so we do find that the scriptures teach that hell is eternal and that those who are sentenced to hell will remain there for eternity and that the condition of the soul is fixed at the point of death and that there are no post-mortem opportunities but that, that's sheer speculation and not taught in Scripture. And that the heretical teaching is usually associated with a denial of these orthodox teachings that we have already shared. Now, here is the first thing that I want to stress. Not everyone will go to heaven. Not everyone will go to heaven. Most would agree if anyone goes to hell, it will be because of how horrible they were. Most would agree that the worst criminals of the world, such as Hitler and Lenin and serial killers and child molesters, will certainly go to hell. Most would agree that psychopaths will be sent to hell because of their sin that has destroyed their consciences and they feel no guilt or remorse for their horrible deeds. But here is the clear teaching of Jesus. More people will be lost than saved. Many are called, but few are chosen. Matthew 7. Let's read these scriptures because they're important. Matthew 7, in verses 13 and 14, Jesus says, <clears throat> Enter the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Verses like that can be multiplied considerably. That there will be more lost than there are saved. But, can I pose this question? Wouldn't you agree that, in general, there are more good people than bad? Wouldn't you agree? In your association with people, except for those that are working in prisons, in general, in our daily walk, we associate with people that are, in general, pretty good people, nice people upright, trustworthy. I think you would agree with that. And so from our human point of view, it seems as if it's a contradiction for Jesus to say that more are going to be lost than saved. And yet that's only 
because we're taking a human point of view and we're judging salvation based upon what we see as being general goodness among people. And so Jesus' percentages seem to contradict our perspective and our observation. And so there must be something that we're missing because of this apparent contradiction or paradox from our own personal observation. Now, look at this passage of Scripture in 2 Thessalonians 1. I've got to have your attention on this because there are some things said here that we often overlook and we can't overlook it. There are two categories of people identified by Paul as being lost. Notice what he says here. These two categories are among those that will suffer punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord. Verse 8, those who do not know God and those who refuse to obey the gospel. There's two categories, not one. Many people would say, if a person never has the opportunity to hear the gospel and he's ignorant of the gospel, then God's just going to judge him based upon whether or not his good outweighs the bad. All right? I wish that were so. I wish I could find the scripture that says that's so. But I can't. This scripture says that those that did not hear the gospel are ignorant of God and equally condemned with those who hear the gospel and reject it. Well, let's look at those who do not obey the gospel. The gospel is the good news. And if I would take the time to read 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 3, we find that Paul declares that the gospel is the message of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. And that believing in that gospel and obeying that gospel delivers us from our sin. We find in Romans 1.16, the power of God is the gospel unto salvation. It is the power of God unto salvation. It's not the teachings of man. It's not the teachings of any religious books. It's the teachings of the death burial, and resurrection of Jesus from the dead. So, this gospel message is the only power of God for salvation in Romans 1 and verse 16. Furthermore, Jesus is the only way to the Father. In John 14, 6, we find that Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one, that's upon the face of the earth. No one on the face of this earth, past, present, or future, will come to the Father except through me, through Jesus Christ, who is the only way to salvation. Acts 4.12, Peter says, There is no other name given under heaven by which man must be saved, and that's Jesus. This therefore excludes man's own goodness, since man's goodness never outweighs his sin. When man says, my goodness outweighs my sin, he's prejudiced, right? He's not being objective. He's being self-deceived. And when he looks upon his neighbor who is a horrible sinner and says, how can God condemn me when there's people like that? He's using the wrong measuring stick. The comparison is not to my neighbor, but to God himself in whom I made in his image. That wasn't very good English, was it? Anyway, in Isaiah 64 and verse 6, Isaiah says all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. 
before God. You mean to tell me the good person who obeys the law, fine father, fine husband, good provider, good citizen, supports good works, that his righteousness is as filthy rags? From God's point of view, yes. Why? Is he giving glory to God for his goodness? Or is he taking it himself? He's worshiping himself and not God. And so what we can't comprehend in our flesh is how God looks upon any sin. You peel back the onion and you can see far more than what we can see on the surface. Every good person has their own secrets their own sins, their own failures, their own weaknesses. And how many times we've seen good people turn out to hide some horrible, horrible, sinful behavior. God can see it. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, it says we are naked before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. God can see us as we really are. And we can only see so often just the surface. We can't see the heart and how sinful it is. The Lord says the heart is wicked. The Lord says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3 and verse 23. So, if there's only way, one way to the Father, that ex excludes my own goodness. Because, once again, my sin will always outweigh my goodness. And we must not allow our own toleration of sin to cloud how God sees sin. Isaiah 64 and verse 6. Filthy rags. And rejecting the gospel alone does not condemn a person to eternal damnation. They're already doomed. Let me give you an illustration. There's a rampant pandemic in the country. And there's only a limited supply of the antidote to cure the people. And more is trying to be made. And there's difficulties in getting this antidote to all the people. Now, will you agree with me that the people that die is not just those who rejected the antidote, but those that didn't get the antidote, right? So these people would die anyway if there wasn't even an antidote, if they can't get the antidote. Does that make sense? Let me apply it. The people in the world are suffering with the disease of sin. And they are dying in their sin because they can't get the antidote. Many do, but far more don't. And they are dying because of their sin. So, it's not the fault of the, of the gospel that condemns people. There are so many people say, well, only those that reject the gospel will go to hell. That's like saying only those people that reject the medicine will die. If they don't get the medicine, they will die. Is that point getting through? You see, the whole message of taking the gospel to the world is that this is the antidote. This is the medicine. This is the cure to save their lives, to save their souls. And so here we have Jesus ready to go to heaven, having accomplished his task of dying for the sins of the world. He says in Mark 16, 15, 16, Now go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. Now get it. 
he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Do they need saving? Yes. Are they lost? Yes. What if the gospel doesn't make it to certain people? What a tragedy. But they die in their sins. Now, let's go on. Number four, those who know not God will also be among those judged. Now, In 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 5, in Romans 1 and 28, this includes both Jews and Gentiles. Romans 10, 2 through 4, these individuals did not know God and they tried to establish a way of righteousness on their own. And so those that do not know God are those that are ignorant of the gospel. Now, it says that the Gentiles do not know God, but they did worship a God. If you read Acts chapter 17 in Athens, Paul says these were very religious people, but they didn't know the true God. All right? So, now, these are those that did not have opportunity to hear the gospel. It includes those that refused to take the opportunity. Say, for example, we come to somebody that does not know God, and you say, I would like to teach you about God. And they say, well, I'm not interested. They die in ignorance, of course. But that's culpable, isn't it? It's their fault. They chose not to be ignorant. So this would include people who choose not to know and who just by accident don't learn. You see, everyone has the moral law and no right from wrong. And some people say, well, there's so, such a great di uh, difference between people's understanding of right from wrong. I disagree with that. And C.S. Lewis makes a strong point that the morality of people is not that different. There may be difference. For example, people may disagree as to how many wives a man should have, but they all agree that a man shouldn't have any woman that he wants. So you see, there's not that much difference. And we all would agree that it's wrong to torture children. So there is a moral law of right and wrong. And we may see good people, but do God see, does God see people like we see people? No, because he sees the heart. And a lot of people are good because it pays to be good. Do you know what I mean? Mm. If I told my boss how I feel about him, he'd fire me. Right? I might hate my boss, but I might act like I like him because it pays to be good. Right? So, I mean, there are a lot of people that are good because it pays to be good. How do we know one from another? God knows, but we don't. You see, the more holy and just God is seen, the less problem we have with good people being lost. Now, read Isaiah chapter 6 and see Isaiah taken up into glory and he sees God on his throne and he hears angels proclaiming, holy, holy, holy is God. And here this righteous man, Isaiah, one of the most righteous men in the old law, under the old law, he says, I am an unclean person, a man of unclean lips among a people of unclean who are unclean. You see, the righteousness of man compared to God is really unrighteousness because it's tainted with impure thoughts, impure motives, and a lot of other things. Now, let's try to deal with the issue of justice with God here. It doesn't seem fair, does it, that those that die in ignorance 
who are good and upright citizens at least don't have a chance. And so because of that has arisen the ideas of post-mortem opportunity. You know what post-mortem means after death? That those that never heard the gospel, they'll be raised and given another chance to hear the gospel and choose whether or not to obey. Quite frankly, I want to be among that group. That's a no-brainer. If you're dead and you're raised from the dead and the Lord says, you do you accept me now? Yeah. <laughs> I guess. You know, to me that's ridiculous. And besides, it fails to take into consideration that once we die, we lose any opportunity to change our personality and our character. And, but yet we have this idea of God's foreknowledge. And if we have any hope for these people, it has to come down to this. God foreknows everything. In Romans chapter 8 those whom he foreknew, he called, or he predestined, and then he called. God's foreknowledge is to know things ahead of time. So God, without forcing this to occur, it's not causative. Some things can be, but the destiny of all of us is dependent upon our choice. But God foreknew God foreknew what would be our choice if the opportunity arose. Now, I'm thinking then that if a person died without hearing the gospel, and he was a sincere, very devout person, very moral person, I'm thinking, wouldn't God know if the gospel was preached to that person, whether or not that person would accept the gospel? Do you agree with me that God would know that? In his foreknowledge, he would know that if that person heard the gospel, he would obey it or reject it. So what I'm saying is that if there's any hope that we can offer, it's that. That God can treat someone as if he's obeyed the gospel because he foresaw that he would if he had heard the gospel. Now, do we have examples of God uh, doing things like that? Treating things as if they were when they weren't? Sure. Genesis 15. God accepted Abraham's faith in place of righteousness. It says he justified him by faith and treated him as righteous. But righteous is perfection, sinlessness. Abraham couldn't give that, but he could give faith. And so God treated his faith as if it were righteousness. You see what I mean? In Romans chapter 2, the Gentiles who by nature did the things of the law would be treated as if they kept the law. Oh, now that's under the old law. Now, is God equally as merciful today as he was to the Gentile before Christ come? Absolutely. Although this is in the realm of opinion and somewhat speculation, I would say that God will look at every situation and the God of all the earth will do right. But if we just say, oh, they'll be okay, what will that do to the motivation for missionary work? Those religious denominations that have basically said everybody out there in the world that don't hear the gospel are okay, they don't spend very much money sending missionaries there. There's no vigilance. There's no motivation. There's no love for the lost. Because, oh, God's going to take care of them anyway. So we've got to be very careful about that. Furthermore, I've got to get this in. One must understand that there are degrees of responsibility and judgment in Scripture. In Matthew 23 and verse 14, Jesus talks about those that will receive greater judgment. 
In Matthew 26, 24, it says, It were better for Judas never to have been born. Well, he doesn't say that about anybody but Judas. So, Judas obviously would have been better off never to have been born because his judgment is going to be more severe than yours and mine. And furthermore, in Mark 9, 42, Jesus said that if somebody, a Christian, would cause another to stumble in sin, it were better for him to have had a millstone put around his neck and cast in the depths of the sea. Obviously, before he caused a brother to stumble. In 2 Peter 3, 20 through 22, we find that Peter says, concerning those that give up the faith, that it were better for them to have never known the way of righteousness than, than to learn it, and that the last state is worse than before, and is true according to the, vom, uh, the proverb that the dog returns to his own vomit and a pig to the mire. So what you see here is that there are degrees of punishment. And people say, well, what about all those pictures and descriptions of hell, of being fire and brimstone and, and outer darkness and all that stuff? Well, let me just say that hell is going to be far worse than all those descriptions. But those script descriptions are only to make us be aware of the punishment that we'll experience, be experienced there. And I think that those are all metaphor. Uh, I don't think you can actually burn a spirit, if you think about it. You can burn physical things, but you can't burn a spirit. So what we find here is that those are descriptions of a place of existence where no good dwells, God cannot be found. The absence of God. The absence of good. And if you think about it, how would you like to live in a city like that? How would you like to live in eternity like that? That there is not one good thing in your environment. You see, there's no second chance as Hebrews 9 and 27. And we must submit, you know, ourselves to the will of God and truly believe that God will take care of every situation, but that we seriously must come down and believe what the scripture says. And we must submit all the speculation and the opinions to the scrutiny of God's word and conclude that is very vital and critical for every single solitary soul to embrace Jesus as their personal Savior and be saved from their sins. So a biblical understanding of sin and judgment and hell and the necessity of Jesus' death to save every sinner, including those who seem righteous, should move us to serve him according to his will and seek and save the lost. Thank you for this, uh, your kind attention to this very difficult subject. <clears throat> I know when I became a Christian, I became a Christian because I didn't want to go to hell. Now, obviously, there are other motivations besides fear. There's love, and that's the greatest motivation. And I would urge you, if you have not obeyed the gospel, that you would take the eternal destiny of the lost seriously. But more importantly, that you realize that God has done everything for you to save your soul and that he has manifested his love and he only wants you to reciprocate. And Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you have not obeyed Baptism, will you not demonstrate your faith in God that is real and that you truly love him by performing this one command that he asks you to do once you believe in the Lord Jesus? Be baptized, Mark 16, 16, and be saved. Please come as together we stand and as we sing.